would tell my parents, I'm going to go bless the children before I leave. And he would, I'd wake up to him fondling me, and he'd be fondling playing with himself. They'd have to be either really stupid and blind. It was obvious that this guy was a pedophile. I believe that this crisis in the United States uh, is every bit as profound as the 16th century Protestant Reformation. I think that nothing less than that kind of Reformation is going to uh, silence this. At his Boston Cathedral, America's most senior Catholic cleric, Cardinal Bernard Law, celebrates Mass, revealing the mystery of the Eucharist. This is the church in full pomp and holiness. I have been willing to speak out about the sexual perversion that's been going on in your church. Where are these priests of integrity? Why aren't they standing here supporting the survivors of? But the congregation is thinning. And to see why, you only have to peer outside, where local priest, Brother Carr, is confronted with the pain and anger caused by the sins of the Catholic fathers. We are up in the air too. We're going, where is this coming from? Uh, meaning, you know, we pick up the newspaper and go, we didn't know this, we didn't know this. We well, didn't why didn't you open your eyes, God damn it? Good question. Oops. Why didn't you open your eyes all these years? How can you say this was the going, other you way? You didn't know it wasn't going on. I don't believe Everybody that. Everybody knew it was going on. I don't believe that for a minute. Oh, we knew it, it was, was going, going on. on. Okay. How many parents went to the... You years ask these people, how many of these parents went to the priest? They went to the same house with the pedophiles, for goodness sakes, so, alive. How can you say that? They knew that they were going on. You personally went to the no excuse. People go up to their bedrooms with kids and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Cardinal Law is in trouble, trouble that could land him in jail. But his real problem, and the Vatican's problem, is that there's a revolution underway. No more pray, pay, and obey. Well, I think that the uh, laity are totally outraged. I think that they, that's where the church is going to be in serious trouble. And I don't think that they realize to this point how angry the Catholics in especially America are right now. I think that that is something that is going, only going to spread. And it is not something that is going to wear thin or wear off. Things may get quiet, but it is not going away. I think that this is just the beginning of a revolution. It's downright offensive to the Catholics that I know to think that these are the people that are in charge of us. Paula Ford is mad at Cardinal Law and with good reason. The Cardinal recently suggested that her six-year-old son Gregory could have somehow been responsible for his abuse by a priest. Gregory is much older now and a troubled young man. What did he do? That's what I would like to know. I know what he didn't do. And what he didn't do was to put the interest of children first. That's the Fords are suing Cardinal Law for knowingly allowing a pedophile priest near their son. In an unprecedented move, the Cardinal has now been forced to answer their questions before a judge. The Cardinal consistently claims the Clinton defence he doesn't recall, nor does he front the media, instead sending Archdiocese spokesman Father Christopher Coyne. And so at times it's fair to say that he couldn't, that, that one couldn't, that he couldn't recall uh, what was done because he, he wasn't really part of the decision-making process that was being done by somebody else below him. If you understand anything, understand this, we will not be silent. We are not going away. The protesters outside the cathedral know exactly who to blame. We do not want any charlatans in the Boston Archdiocese of Massachusetts. Somebody has to be in charge. It's got to be the Cardinal. Somebody has to take responsibility. And it, clearly it's Cardinal Law. Clearly the Cardinal has known for many, many years. Since he came here in 1984, he's been receiving reports of various priests molesting children. And he made a decision early on that the way he was going to handle it was to try to keep everything covered up. Not All their lives, Phil Saviano and Susan Renahan 
held tightly the dark secrets of their abuse. Now they're helping others go public with a new survivors network for those abused by priests, or SNAP. I knew him when I was 11 and 12 years old, um, living in a very small town in central Massachusetts. I was Catholic. Uh, I was not an altar boy, but I was the newspaper boy. He was leaving the parish and I went over to say goodbye to him and he took me into the vestibule and gave me a French kiss and I was 11 years old. We were uh, performing sex on him, um, masturbation, oral sex, performing on the priest in the church, in the church basement, in the rectory. In the end he had me get in the car and he sexually abused me at that time, fondled me, had me fondle him, and uh, that continued really up to the next three years. There could be people in the church praying, saying the Stations of the Cross during Lent or whatever, and Father Holly could be in the sacristy with, with the kid having sex. He uh, came up to my classroom after confession and took me into the hallway and sexually abused me once again. And yet, I knew that if it was a sin, I, I better confess it. Well, what do you do when your abuser is also your confessor? And when you're 11 and 12 years old, how do you, how do you work that out? I never told my parents. I felt uh, so much shame and humiliation um, that I felt that I couldn't cause them that kind of pain. And so I never told them. And uh, my mother passed away last March. And one of the things I thought when she passed away was, well, now I can talk. I have a very unique feeling coming back here now. Uh, I came here uh, over 55 years ago as a youngster. A former Benedictine monk, Richard Sype is an internationally respected writer on the sexuality of Catholic priests. He was here at St. John's College in Minnesota for many years. I was 13 years old when I came here and I was 38 years old when I was dispensed. And so I was a student here for six years and then went into the monastery for 18 years. Uh, so that's 24 years of uh, my life was, was spent here. But this is not a nostalgic visit by an old boy to his alma mater. After years of counselling victims of clergy abuse and perpetrators alike, Richard Sype has returned on a chilling mission to help one of his own family who was attacked by a monk here a monk who told his victim, Look, I've waited eight years to do that. And if you don't like it, sue me and you'll get $10,000 or something. But absolutely no compassion, compunction, no, no shred of, of shared experience. Or so. I mean, I'm, I'm really speechless with it. It's just, uh, if I thought about it too much, I'm afraid I would cry. The sexual activity is passed from the top down and it's passed on, it's given permission for by people who are high to others who are in training who then abuse others. There's no question there's a structure to it that is so ominous and so contradictory. It's so opposite the beauty and the warmth and, 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 and all that, that one lifts one spiritually. Uh, and uh, it is the dark side, it is the underbelly. A few kilometres down the road from St John's College is the tiny midwestern town of St Cloud, Minnesota. Inside the local church, a town meeting has been called to vent the public's views on the systematic abuse and cover-ups back up the road at St John's. They'll throw us out of here. We were not allowed into the meeting, but it didn't stop the anger coming to us. For harboring more, they've talked about it already, about possibly that being a home base for pedophiles from around the country. It's alleged between 13 and 18 monks at St John's 
are guilty of sex offences. Like we've already got 18 of them sitting out there that have never been brought to justice, have never been prosecuted, have never done a day in jail, and now they want to bring more? I tell you. Could you get copies and, and send it to them? The problem throughout America, and in fact the world, is that until now the Catholic Church has kept law enforcement for the crime of abusing minors at bay by thinking priestly sins could be redeemed by treatment and reassignment, a wall of canon law. What needs to happen, they need to take these places apart brick by brick and rebuild them and quit making the hierarchy of this church royalty. They're not royalty. They're not above the law. They should be available to civil law just like any of us. Isn't that what they're trying to address though? Isn't no. This is, this is just a bunch of big schmoozing. That's all this is. Mary Oakley is not alone. Well, they've got to start being accountable, not harboring these, these priests out at St. John's. That isn't where they get them in jail. Yep, they're not doing enough. <laughs> they're not putting them in jail. This Kenny, he's got to put these, these people got to go to jail. I think that Bishop John Kinney is the man taking the heat. I would, I would encourage anybody where they feel that there has been an abuse of a minor that they go directly to the police. Right. I don't think they should come to the diocese anymore because obviously, number one, the trust level isn't there. And number two, an independent investigation needs to happen. Ironically, this bishop led a 1993 ad hoc committee directed to give recommendations on how the church should handle the molestation problem. But many of his fellow bishops simply refused to implement the new rules. I am uh, very uh, saddened and I'm very angry that some of my brothers sat at the meeting and uh, seemed to agree with everything we were recommending and went home and did not put it into practice. You That's very uh, disturbing to me. That were the bishops? Those were the bishops. I was told that Rome can't figure out why the American bishops can't control the courts and the press better. Good Lord. That came from the Vatican? That came from uh, the Vatican, from a person relatively high up in the Vatican. By the way, it had worked this way for a long time. It worked a long time in Ireland this way. Yes, absolutely. Mm. You know, Controlling the press and the courts. And it has worked in the United States very much this way until Boston. Boston has cracked the secret system. That's what's shaken the foundation of everything. The whole story broke in Boston, a city where half the population is Catholic. It was broken by one of America's great papers, the Boston Globe. What stunned the good people of Boston and America was that after many years of secrecy and denial, the Globe got a court ruling that forced open church files, thousands of documents revealing how the most senior church officials knowingly moved pedophile priests around the country and secretly paid off their victims. People might think from what they've seen that there's something in the water here in Boston that causes different behavior. And we think that the difference here between here and the rest of the country is that so much documentation has come out here. The Globe's assistant managing editor, Walter Robinson, leads the investigative team that shone the spotlight where no one else had dared. The documents came out and the documents show that the cardinals, not just Cardinal Law, but his predecessors, the bishops, the monsignors, all of the people at the top and many of the people in the pastors and the parishes, for years covered up the pedophilia and a feeblephilia, the attraction to the teenage boys, of so many priests. And when you look at the documents that came free in January, uh, all of the concern is for the priests in the documents, in the letters from the cardinal. There's scant and or no mention of the victims, of the kids at all. There was an effort to protect the church and uh, to protect the priest and uh, protect the people from scandal. And so if, if we, if in many times, if we could have avoided going to the authorities uh, to avoid 
uh, persecution uh, um, or um, having the priest arrested, that's, that's what happened. Isn't that in itself criminal behavior? No, because we weren't mandatory reporters. We're not the, the bishop or the priest's um, administration in the archdiocese. We're not, in fact, uh, civil authorities or legal authorities. We had no legal requirement or civil requirement in the sense of demand of, to, to demand of law. I think it was part of the, the protective culture of the church at that time. I mean, nobody, I think, ever sat down and said, let's put children at risk. It's a mess. The church is short of priests and short of money, and it's being asked to hand over both in startling amounts. Since January, the Boston Archdiocese alone has been forced to give police the names of almost 100 priests. Money is suddenly very short because the very conservative old money Bostonians are putting their money where their feelings are, somewhere else. I first thought with Cardinal Law, well, he made a mistake, and he's a good man. But now, after all this comes out in the last few, uh, so many months, um, other people would be in jail. The really the graces. The, the Boston is a pretty conservative town, and it's it's very very rare that that people in this community stand up and challenge the leadership, uh, and certainly in the church. The church is a very powerful institution here, but. Uh, uh, but people have been so sickened by these deplorable actions and by the cover-up uh, that it has gotten them up out of their chairs, out of the pews, and the people in the pews are now saying that we have to change the system. I felt that I had to come up to rally in front of the cathedral yesterday. These uh, people are upper-middle-class Boston. They believe in their religion, uh, but not in the current voting. hierarchy. Uh, they are the voice of the faithful. The Using the, the internet, we they're an organization that's grown from zero to 10,000 members across 20 I'm nations in just four months. We have we have the they're a real threat to the established administration of the church. Grey-haired revolutionaries from the town that threw out the English nearly 300 years ago. They really are the church. They control the money and they're afraid only of God. They are the really the, the bedrock support of the church financially. So they're when wealthy, these they're wealthy people. They, many of them are wealthy people, but they're all they're all really re relatively affluent middle class people and they're and they're voting with their pocketbooks as well as with their votes. And the reason that they're here is to express their voice verbally, but then they'll also back it up with their with their with their checkbooks. It's going to hurt Catholic schools, it's going to hurt the shelters, uh, homeless shelters, uh, the health care services. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are Why the would they cut off we funds the to the needy? Christ. Because despite assurances to the contrary, these people believe the money could be used by the church hierarchy to get themselves out of trouble. These people aren't exceptions. They're just the church has already reneged on payments they had agreed to pay to victims like Patrick and Anthony, here in conference with their lawyer, Mitchell Garabedian. Oh yeah, the church is doing everything they can legally. They're not, they're not knocking on my door saying we made a mistake and we're morally and we're sorry we hurt your clients emotionally and spiritually. They're fighting this as though they were a big oil company or a big gas company or a major corporation, I should say. These priests get away with the dirtiest of deeds. And now Along with scores of others, Patrick and Anthony were molested by a notorious priest, Father John Gagan, now behind bars. It's a depressingly familiar story and spans decades. A priest preying on children, known to his superiors and kept in the community by his superiors. It's like taking a murderer with a weapon and saying, here, you know, you shot these people, but take this gun over here and go in this town and do what you want over there because they let these priests go molest people. Patrick was the same priest who molested me, could have been prevented in my time. He went on through other parishes, four or five more parishes, to victimize Patrick and hundreds, you know, not hundreds, but a hundred other people. They let these pedophiles use their robe from 30 to 50 years to go around molesting children. And they didn't know about it? You know what I mean?
It's clear there is a problem within the priesthood of pedophilia. The best studies show 6% of priests have been and are right now having illegal sex with minors. The fact it wasn't taken seriously could be based in the unique sexual culture of the church, the vows of celibacy that are themselves now not believed. The church has not dealt with sexuality and celibacy rationally. At any one time, 50% of priests are practicing celibacy, which means another 50% are not practicing. At Richard Sipes' figures are based on academic research on thousands of priests carried out over decades. The lie of celibacy has, he says, been something of an open secret. Uh, heterosexual activity among priests is kind of winked at. If it doesn't make a scandal, if it doesn't make a baby, if it doesn't make uh, some waves. But, you know, kind of, kind of who cares? Boys will be boys, men will be men. The Boston Globe agrees. What, know. what appears to be the case is that within the church, there has been a lot of winking about sexual activity, uh, even of the consenting adult type for, dare we say this, centuries. Mm -hmm. And that when a problem got too hot, when it involved children, they would move the offending priest along. I said in 1991 that the sexual abuse of minors is the tip of the iceberg of sexual activity of priests. The reason it is is because the legal system and now the media also is not afraid to tackle that very difficult problem. But I said if you follow that to its foundation, you are, it's going to lead you to the highest corridors of the Vatican, and I believe that. You mean the highest corridors of the Vatican practicing? Unlawful sex with minors? Some, some, and sexual, like having sexual lives, non-celibate uh, activity. Obviously, this document is the fruit of a nationwide discussion around this issue. The Once more, Father Coyne is the mouthpiece the for a media-shy clergy, and he's got the toughest job in Boston, representing a church which has lost all authority, a cardinal with no credibility, and a priesthood whose sexuality at all levels is now suspect. I've been a priest for over 16 years now, and while I have had incident, well, there has, I've known of incidents where, with my brother priests who have broken their vow of celibacy, either with a man or a woman, uh, for the most part, the vast majority of priests with whom I live and work every day are committed to their celibacy and live it. There isn't this underground um, kind of like sexual nation out there that's kind of working its way through the clergy. The anger is such that this crisis is moving out of the church's control and into the hands of lawyers and the police. The anger and lawsuits are no longer focused just on pedophiles, but on the church officials who continue to knowingly employ them. The actions of the most senior church officials of the land, including Cardinal Bernard Law of the Archdiocese of Boston, are now open to legal and potentially even criminal investigation. My hunch would be, from what's coming out around the country, is that some prosecutor somewhere is going to indict a bishop or a cardinal pretty soon. That I think that's bound to happen. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's enough anger among the Catholic laity. Uh, much of the reaction you get from people, they're much angrier at cardinal law than they are even at the offending priests, they say, well, the priests were sick. They couldn't control their impulses. Well, what about the man who was in charge of them, who was supposed to protect our children? It's unclear as to uh, what the cardinal did know and, wh and, what he, and when he knew it, uh, if anything. And, um, and that's why we're, we're going through this long legal process like now, because uh, there is, some would say that he knew a lot more at the very beginning than, 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 he, than he actually, in fact, does. Well, documents now emerging would indicate that's the case. There are documents that, that point to um, that, that point to 
possibility of his knowing certain things. But then again, it's, it's a question of, did he see the document? Did he even bother reading it when he was signing it? Something like that. That began, it's Sorry, did he, know, did he read it when he signed it? I mean, that's a, right. that's a f fairly big leap. Well, Is that possible? I don't know. But I would just offer, the, no, I don't want. I would offer this. What, sometimes, uh, what do you think? I would just say it's a matter of ongoing litigation. And it's a uh, he knows and must know that the vast majority of the laity in his own archdiocese would like him to go. Many people are withholding their contributions and say that they won't give again until he does go. Uh, one does get the sense by talking to people around him that he would probably like to go, but the Vatican does not obviously want to be seen as responding to public whims or public sentiment. The American Roman Catholic Church is agreed on one thing. This is the greatest crisis in its history. The church hierarchy stands accused of knowingly harboring perverts it stands accused of allowing the little children to suffer. It stands accused of breaching faith with its congregations. The cardinals, bishops and priests stand accused of putting their well-being, their positions and their reputations above the safety of the most innocent of their flocks.